you so much for joining us today at the Hilton. We are so excited uh, that you are here. If it's been a while since you've been with us, we are in week two of a series we started last week. Last weekend was Valentine's Day weekend, and we thought, man, it's really, we, we need to do something about relationships, not only um, our relationships with each other, but also something that reflects um, our relationships with God. And so we're in week two of this series called Love Illuminated. I, I will go ahead and tell you, if you were not here last Sunday, uh, and this doesn't make you feel guilty, it's just to encourage you to do something, um, please go on our website and, and check out last week's message. And, and here's why, not just because uh, I'd love for you to do that, but really a lot of the things we're talking about today, um, they only make sense in real, real you'll, you'll enjoy it if you weren't there, but they'll only really make sense in real context if you were with us last weekend. Because last weekend what we really talked about is the whole point of marriage, the whole purpose of marriage, the whole purpose of this relationship called marriage, it, it's not to make us happy, it's not to bring fulfillment, it's not to, to do all the things that some Sometimes we look for really marriage the purpose of marriage is to make us look more like Jesus because in marriage we learn to serve someone else we learn to compromise we learn to give so if you go into marriage thinking you're going to get something you're going to be very very disappointed because the, the person that we go to to get something is not to our married spouse it's to Jesus Christ and if, if so if you're single I want to go and tell you marriage does not make your life easier all our married couples want to say amen you can yeah it does not make you thank you with vigor um, it does not make your life easier easier. I mean, I, guys, and, and we got a lot of, uh, of young men and women here at the front, which is awesome. I, like, I'm still young enough, even at 30, I remember like, man, just thinking, when I get married, it's going to be so amazing. Cause I, and I thought this when I was a teenager. I have somebody who's going to cook for me and clean for me and be ready to do, you know what else for me, you know what I'm like? And, just being real, when you're a teenager, you think that way. When you're a college student, sometimes you, you think that way. The purpose is not to make life easier. The purpose is marriage makes you more like Jesus. And so uh, we, we really look like you know, marriage is just a reflection of what God has given to us. And what we've been doing, guys, uh, is we've been taking some biblical couples at, that, that are not perfect and really looking at how their love relationship uh, reflects us and God in so many ways. So last week, uh, we looked at an incredible couple, uh, actually three people. We looked at Jacob and Rachel and Leah, uh, and, and that love triangle. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about another couple, Hosea uh, and Gomer. And before we dive into their story, which is an incredible story of forgiveness and mercy and love and betrayal and, and sin, and there's all kinds. Um, I, I wanted to say something. This, this past week has been really neat. Um, I've probably gotten more emails and more text messages and, and, and more responses uh, from, the, from last week's message than any series that we've done except for Frequently Asked Questions. A couple of years ago, we did a series all about Frequently Asked Questions, and we talked about drinking and tattoos and piercings and all kinds of stuff like that. Other than that series, which blew away all the others as far as people wanting to have questions and responses, last week's message has been the most since. And, and so I wanted to kind of say something because um, the, the, the messages I got, um, there were a lot of like, oh, this was great and a lot of good questions. But there were a lot of people that messaged me and said, Jason, you know, I'm not even sure if I love Jesus anymore uh, because because of the way you describe um, how, how we're supposed to be pursuing him. Uh, and and, and if, you, if you feel that way sometimes when you hear me preach, good. <laughs> because, uh, because I think we're supposed to work out our salvation uh, with fear and trembling. And it's a lot more fun to talk about fun messages, but we really need to hear hard things sometimes. And, uh, and just yesterday, uh, I was spending some time with, with Gabby, and God kind of spoke to me in, in, in the middle of playing with her, which he does with my kids a lot, y'all, like a lot. And, and he said, you need to share this with the Ignite Films, so I want to share it with you. Uh, my daughter um, is a lot like my mom. Uh, for those of you who never had the chance of knowing her, she's been with the Lord now for uh, six years. Um, she was what I would call not only does she not like sports, she's like actually anti-sports. Like she's the she's the girl like you could throw a softball to her for hours and she'll never she's never gonna touch the ball. Uh, she's someone you can set a soccer ball in front of her and you say kick in the net, just kick in the net, or we're gonna kill one of your children. She would actually do the Charlie Brown flip and you know mid and like be on the floor like she gets anti you know ha, ha, not not a sports bone in her body. And my daughter Gabby is a lot like that. And as a dad. You can only do so many tea parties. Brother, say amen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, you're trying to find your place with this now six-year-old playing with her. Like, to, to, I'm just confessing here. Like, to make my, to, I'm trying to teach my daughter how to ride a bike. You'd think I was pulling her teeth out one by one. Like, she, like she, she's like that. And so it's been interesting, you know, um, trying 
we found something that we kind of connect with, and it's right now she really loves. She's really gotten into Legos ever since the Lego. Anybody else like Legos? Anyone here? Okay, a couple of you guys. Like, uh, I didn't really appreciate Legos. I didn't grow up doing Legos. But after a Lego movie, uh, my daughter wanted to get some Legos, and they have all kinds of girl Legos now, which is really cool. And, and so um, she, we've gotten into doing Legos, and, and it makes sense. My, my mom was an artist, and with Legos, you're creating these beautiful things. And my wife, she's a mathematician, so she's really good at following the instructions, and Gabby's got like both in a really, really big way. So we're doing Legos, and she's correcting me, and we're following the instructions, and, and we're putting together Ariel's castle, but it was the most macho Ariel's castle ever, brothers. Anyway, so it's still Legos. So we're putting together this castle, and um, we, we were about 30, 45 minutes into building this castle. And um, Gabby um, was looking at the instructions, and she says, oh, no, Daddy, we missed a piece. And, and we noticed that there was a piece, like, on instruction 2. Now we're on instruction 48. No joke, y'all, okay? This is, this, it was like that. It was like that that we had not put in place. And so what we had to do, this piece, it, it looked so minor on piece two, but so important on, piece four, on, on page 48, we had to take the castle apart um, and, and, and put that piece in. Um, some people that, that, that have been messaging me saying, you know, I just feel like sometimes my heart's getting stomped on um, by this. I just want you to know, if you're feeling that way a little bit by some of the, the word that you are receiving recently from me at Ignite, I think it's because God is dismantling your Legos so that he can make your foundation strong. Um, I grew up in a fantastic church, and so I'm not casting stones in any church. If you're a visitor here, I don't want you, but like, I grew up in a church, no, and, and wonderful people, and wonderful, so many good things, but it's like, I thought I could be a Christian and never invite anybody to experience Jesus, and that was okay. I was a Christian for years and years and years and thought that it was okay to not pursue God passionately in his word and in prayer as long as I was showing up to church and to youth activities and doing those things. I, I thought that I had this understanding of what it meant to know God. And I'm just being honest with you, I did not know him. I knew of him. I did not know him. And so some of you, as we talk about these difficult things, and you're like, I'm not even sure I know Jesus anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, that's really good because it could be the Holy Spirit. He's breaking the foundations of, of something maybe you put up that wasn't right so that he can build something that's strong and beautiful and eternal. So I say that because today's message is going to be real hard, y'all. It's going to be a tough message. And so if you're ready for a tough message, it's going to kick you in the face a little bit. In the name of Jesus. Would y'all, would y'all do something for me on the count of three? Would y'all say, sock it to me? One, two, three. Sock it to me. Okay, you asked for it. Here we go. <laughs> Let's dive into the word. Hosea, chapter one, starting with verse two, looking at verse three as well. This is the story of uh, a man named Hosea and a woman named Gomer. Poor Gomer, she ain't got a chance to name like that. Let's just look a little bit at their story. It says, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go take to yourself an adulterous wife, and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And so what, what we have here, to give you a little background as to what's going on, on here, um, Hosea, he's, he's kind of like, in a modern context, he's kind of like me. He's a, he's a pastor. Uh, he's somebody that preaches God's word. He's pursuing the Lord. And God, um, in, in his prayer time, says something very strange to Hosea. He says, Hosea, I want you to get married. And Hosea's like, yes, finally. You know what I'm saying? At, at first, he says, but, 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 here's the thing. I don't want you to go look in the church to find your bride. I don't want you to go looking into all the places that normally you go. I, I want you to go and find somebody with a broken past. I want you to go find somebody that, that has, that's done a few things wrong. I want you to go find someone that's been living in sin because your marriage to her is going to represent the fact that Israel has been sinning against me. You see, in this time in Israel's history, they were living a very, very prosperous life. At this period, when Hosea was written, um, people were making good money. There were no enemies coming against Israel. Life was good. And here's the thing, and it's so interesting because we can see it in our culture here today. Whenever materially the blessings increased, spiritually, everything decreases. And I believe that's so true in our country as well, guys. I'm so thankful for our blessings, but over and over and over again, throughout Israel and throughout us as well, whenever things get really easy for people, life seems good on the surface, but deep down, we wonder if we even need God. And so Israel was going through a period like that. And so this guy, he marries a woman named Gomer. And what we know about her um, is it, it, not much. Uh, when the Bible says she was an adulterous wife, um, if you read the King James Version, it says she was a harlot. Um, or some other versions would say she was a prostitute. Go and marry a prostitute. So this is a very broken woman who's been involved with a lot of sin. She has a very broken background. 
And she goes and marries this preacher. So you, you know right off the bat, man, this story is going to be really, really interesting. What happens when a prostitute and a preacher walk into a bar together? Never mind, I'm not going there. Anyway, like, you know, kind of like, it's like a bad joke or something. But, but so anyway, so, that, so they get married. They get married, and at first, things are really, really good. Putting this in a modern context, you know, this guy, he marries this woman. And, and from the woman's perspective, it's like, finally, a God-fearing good guy loves me and wants me. And I can imagine at first, they're together, and they love each other, and they're going through the, the honeymoon phase of their relationship, and they're doing ministry together, and life is good. And they, they get pregnant, because you know what happens when you get married, that happens, and, and, and life is good. And she bears him a son, and at first, everything seems great. Until life starts to get into the way. Um, I don't know exactly what happens in the story of Hosea and Gomer as far as behind the scenes. But, but apparently life began to get in the way for them. And life, by the way, gets in the way with us and God too. You see, this whole story that we're going to be looking at today, it's not just for married couples. And, it ha- and it's not just about physical faithfulness and marital faithfulness. It's about us and God. Because they're a reflection of us and God. When, when you first came to know Jesus, brothers and sisters, and when I came, man, when you look back and remember what was it like to realize that God loved you and forgives you and washes away your sin at first. And we're so excited about the things of God. Some of you, man, you've told me stories about how you went to the altar broken and weeping. Like you felt the Holy Spirit was pulling you like you couldn't resist. And, and you start reading, you start praying, and everything is passionate and so good. And you're seeing new things from God every day. You're having that honeymoon period with the Lord. And then life starts to get in the way. And what happens when life starts to get in the way is that we stop appreciating the things we have and we start looking at all the things that we don't have. And the story of Hosea and Gomer, guys, I I don't know, his ministry might have started to grow. And all of a sudden, so Hosea isn't home as much. And he's leaving Gomer by herself with the baby. And, and, it, and it's hard. And Hosea, he's a great prophet, but he don't know how to change no poopy diapers. And so he, isn't, he isn't helping very much. And he isn't doing the things that she wants him to do. And so life starts to get in the way. And, and, and she's had a baby now. And, and when you have a baby, guys, uh, things change. Sisters, you want to say amen? Things change. Body changes. Hormone changes. You know what I'm saying. So things, things start to change. So she's not looking the same. She's not feeling the same. The wow, wow, it might not be exactly the same as it was before. You know, things change. I'm trying to keep it PG here. Trying to keep it, but things change. Somebody's little baby's like, what's a wow, wow, mommy? You know, <laughs> when you're older, when you're older. Um, things started changing, and, and, and he starts doing his thing, and she starts doing their thing, and it becomes very easy to take each other for granted. And so, you know, in the story, if you put it in a modern context, maybe this, this woman, Gomer, you know, maybe she decides, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fit again. So she starts going to the gym. And all of a sudden, a very attractive personal trainer starts giving her lots of attention. And she likes that. And she's going out and working. You know, my, I might as well work. My husband's always gone. I might as well get a job, too. And she goes. And the guys there are so nice. And, and they listen to her. There's even one that's brought her some flowers. And we just have so much in common. And, and all of a sudden, um, Gomer begins to develop these connections with these other people outside of her husband. And things start to change. And that happens with us in Jesus, too. We're walking along close to him, in love with him, and the temptation starts to pass our way. The trial starts to pass our way, and all of a sudden we begin to think, is what I have really enough? Is what I have really enough? Guys, I I want you to to do something for me, and I I think it's powerful just to kind of see it. How many of you who are either married right now or would like to be married one day, how many of you are going into marriage with the intention of being with your spouse until the day you die? Raise your hand, unashamedly. Okay, most of you. Most of you. Um, but the statistic is, is that half of those of you who raised your hands are not going to succeed in that endeavor. You say, why? It's not because you wake up one day, I'm going to ruin my life. You know, like, nobody... <laughs> Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Woohoo! If, if, if you wake up and that's the first thing that comes out of your mouth, please call me and I will pray with you and we'll, we're going to get you help. Because you, we don't do that. You don't, no one just does. It's gradual and slow and it's day by day and it's moment by moment and it's step by step and it's temptation by temptation. And this is what happens. You can write this down. This is the most common marriage misconception and it's the most common misconception with us and God too. What I'm missing is better than what I have. It's the most common misconception in marriage relationships, and it's the most common misconception in our marriage relationship with God, because I want you to know, if you belong to God, he considers you to be his bride. You are married to him. You belong to him. 
And, and, and sometimes we get find ourselves in a place where what I have is just not as good as what I'm missing. And what I'm missing, man, it looks so much better than what I have. Um, what I call this, brothers and sisters, especially in marriage, I call this the 80-20 principle. And if you want to write 80-20, you can. I mean, it's totally up to you. Because here's the, here's the reality, especially for those of you who are single, I just want you to, to know this, because I didn't completely know this. If you are expecting any person to meet 100% of your need and 100% of your want, you are going to be very disappointed. Someone say amen to that. The, a good, solid marriage, if you have a good, solid, Christ-loving spouse, they can meet 80% of your need and want. They, 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 that means they're devoted to you and they love you and they're there for you, but they're never going to be able to be all things all the time in every way. It's, that's a standard that's impossible to live up. You are blessed if you have someone that's like, you know what? Yeah, most of the time, most of the time, I really feel like they're there for me. Now, for those of you guys that are not math majors, 80% is better than 20%. It's greater, amen? You know what I'm saying? It's better. But what we do sometimes, and we do this in sin too, we see the 20% that we don't have with our spouse or that we don't have with God, and we say, ooh, that looks really good. Oh, my gosh, you know, that, that, that girl at work, she loves Carolina basketball just like me. That's amazing. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, but now, is she going to be a good mom? I don't know. Will she manage I don't know. I don't know, but she, we have that thing in common. Oh, that guy, that guy at the gym, he, he really listens to me. Last time, we spent more time talking than we did working out. My husband, he won't, you know, that, well, is he going to, you know, all the things that matter, we ignore sometimes. And we say, oh, but it's 20 percent. It looks really, really, really good. Guys, um, I just want to say this to you because I love you in your relationship with Jesus and with, with each other. If the grass looks greener on the other side, it's just because you're not noticing the poop on the other side as well. Amen. If the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, you get closer to that fence and you're going to realize it stinks over there too if you're not careful. If the grass looks greener on the other side, don't jump the fence. Water your lawn until the grass gets green. Because you see, here's the thing, and this is I'm talking about marriages here just for a second. Um, you think with this other person, that things will be different. But, but look, when you marry this other person, then the bills all of a sudden become important again. And the kids all of a sudden become important again. And your time becomes all of a sudden all important again. And the house becomes important again. And on and on. And on. Say, I, I never fight with this person here, but I'm fighting with my wife. It's because they don't care about those things. It's an illusion. It's a rainbow. And you can chase that thing down. And if you ever do get grabbed a hold of it, you're going to find out it's, it's not a pot of gold at the end of that thing. It's a lie. And we see here in this, in this story that Gomer trades in the 80 for the 20 that she doesn't feel like she's getting. Let me just read this for you, Hosea 2.5. This is what Gomer says. She says, I want to go after my lovers because they'll give me my food and they'll give me my water. They'll provide me with wool and linen, with oil and drink. So and what she's saying there is kind of figurative language. She's saying, you know what, I married this guy. I thought he was a good guy, but he isn't meeting all my needs. I'll go find someone who will meet all my needs and before we start to think too harshly of her we need to realize we so do this with Jesus we have a God that loves us so much he died to be with us he cares about us he's passionate for us and so often we're running over everything else oh this sin will meet my need this thing will meet my need this entertainment will meet I'm just talking about me y'all in comparison to the time that I'm really intentionally focused on God versus all these other things sometimes I feel like I'm cheating on him so greatly in my own life. And guess what? You are too. I mean, I want you to know um, how God feels about this. So write this down, guys. Um, oh, wait, let me give you this, this next verse. This is good. Jeremiah 3, 9, um, 8 and 9. It says, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed, they committed adultery. I put her away. I gave her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. You see, what we're going to see in the story of Hosea and Gomer, and what we saw last week in the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah, is that the big picture has nothing to do with people. The big picture has to do with you and God, because he is the central relationship in your life. And what God's saying here in these verses, he's saying, look, when I look at my children, when I look at my people, they're running after everything else, and it makes me feel like they're cheating on me. It makes me feel like they've committed adultery on me. Now, most of us would say, I've never committed adultery on God. 
But I want you just for a moment, look from the perspective of heaven. Where is your trust? Where is your love? Where is your time? Where is your attention? If God is looking at your life, would he feel like you've been cheating on him a little bit? In Israel, he says, look, man, they've defiled themselves with stone and wood. And some of you are saying, well, I, I can't remember the last time I bowed down to a piece of wood, so I must be okay. I can't remember the last time I carved out a false god out of stone, so I must be okay. Brothers and sisters, in America, our gods are different. Our gods are very, very different, but they're very, very real. Our gods are gods of entertainment. I meet so many, and I'm saying that if I'm talking about you, I, I love you. <laughs> I meet so many Christians, they watch two to four hours of TV every single day, but they don't have five minutes to read their Bible. And you're trying to say that you aren't committing spiritual adultery against your God. Let's just be real for a second, y'all. Let's just be real. I love you. Let's just be real for a moment here. Is anybody's toes against that? Don't get a little bit. Mine are. <laughs> my, 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 mine are. I, I, I meet so many people. Our gods are made of stone or wood. Our gods are made out of paper and they're green. And they offer security and they offer promise. And they say, if we have enough of it, we'll just be happy. When we know in our heart and in God's word that He is our provision. Guys, I, I can't talk about any one of you. But I can talk about me. This week, as I've been trapped with my kids and my wife and, and everything in the ice and the snow, man, I, I, don't even, I spent a lot. Yeah, it was, it was good, but I was trapped, but it was good. <laughs> I don't know if she's here. So if you see something flying and hit me, that was my wife. <laughs> but, I love you. But, but I, as I was like, man, I realized something. I am such a spiritual adulterer. I have cheated on my father over and over and over again. And I'm so thankful that Jesus always takes me back, that he always forgives me, that he always loves me. Can we say a big amen to that? all of us at Night Church? Amen. He loves us no matter what. But I, I want to see where we're at. So if you're saying this message is not for me, it is for you because every person in this room has committed spiritual adultery against our God that loves us more than we can imagine. Let me give you a couple of his responses. And if you're a spouse and you're dealing with this in your marital, this, these responses are normal as well. First of all, righteous anger. And this is something I really want you to embrace, especially about God. Sometimes we mistakenly view God as distant and emotionless, that he doesn't really care, that he's separate from us. But that's not the God of the scriptures. The God of the scriptures, he lives in us and he is with us and he cares deeply about us. He calls himself a jealous God. He is jealous over you. And look at what we see here in Hosea 2. Um, the anger that God feels at those who are committing spiritual adultery. He says, she is not acknowledged. I was the one who gave her grain. I was the one that gave her new wine and oil, who lavished on her silver and gold. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens, my new wine when it's ready. I'll take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her nakedness. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will do what? What does it say, guys? It's good. We'll take her out of my hands. I love that last part. That's my favorite. That's why I underlined it. Uh, it's really, really good. So here's what's going on here. God is talking about Israel, and he's saying, listen, they think that all these other gods have blessed them. They think that all these other opportunities have fulfilled them, but they, they forgot. I'm the one that takes care of them. I'm the one that allows them to get up out of bed every morning. I'm the one that's there. Everything they have is a gift from me. And so, you know what? I'll take it all away. I'll take it all away. And maybe when I take it all away, they'll return back to me. And in the history of Israel, we see this happen over and over and over again. God loves his people so desperately and passionately and jealously. He says, okay, you're not going to worship me. Let's let an enemy nation come in. They will enslave you. They will harm you. But guess what? You'll turn back to me. I love you so much. I would rather you love me in chains than be without me sitting around, surrounded by gold. Have you ever thought about God that way? In my own life, guys, I guess I, I talk about me. Again, every walk is, is, is different. I talk about my walk. I, reading this, I wonder sometimes, our God, the God of gods and the King of kings who sits on that glorious throne, the Bible says he's surrounded by these angels called the seraphim. And all the seraphim apparently do all day long is they circle the throne of heaven and they call out to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They call out how holy he is. I wonder sometimes if about me, Jason Lumber, if God every once in a while turns to the seraphim and says, look, why doesn't Jason love me like you do? Why, why doesn't Jason, my child, love me the way you do? Because I've blessed him, and I've provided for him, and I've spoken to him, and I've saved him, and yet he runs after all these things. Why doesn't he love me? Am I not enough? Am I 
not enough. Have you ever thought, my brothers and sisters, that God felt that way about you? For those that have ever gone through unfaithfulness in their marriage, that's one of the first things that the spouse feels is, am I not enough? Why would you, am I not? The God of heaven feels that way about you. When you run after your sin, when you run after your disobedience, when you run after the things of this world, I want you to know our God feels that way about you. But not only does he feel anger, this is really good. He also feels unfailing love. Unfailing love. And that's the beauty of it. That, that, that last verse kind of leading into this. God says, look, all these things are going to happen because I'm not going to lose you. You are mine and I love you. You will not be snatched from my hands. I love you no matter what. And I'm so thankful for a God that feels that way. And Hosea, he expresses it like this. He says, therefore, I'm going to allure her back. So, so you have this person that's been unfaithful, and God said, I'm going to allure her back. I'm going to lead her into the desert, and I'll speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And guys, I want you to write down something, because this is really powerful when you realize. There was actually a real valley in Israel called the Valley of Accor, and what the word Accor means, it means trouble. So God is saying, this person, I'm going to take them through trouble, but in the midst of their trouble, in the midst of their trial, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their pain, I'm going to open a door of hope for them. And let them know that no matter what, I love them. I am with them. And I will never leave them. Some of you in this room right now, and I, I love you so much. And I mentioned this first service. I, I want to share it with you guys as well. Just being, this is so real. At Ignite, um, as a part of our announcements, we always um, say, you know, to fill out your prayer cards. I want you to know something. I go through every single one of your prayer cards every week. No joke. And I don't, I'm not, I don't want to applause for that. I don't want to. I love being able to walk with you. And in the privacy of my office, there are many of you in this room. I have, I have wept over what you've shared with me. I have wept walking with you. And it is a blessing. There, there are some pastors, as their churches get bigger, they kind of separate themselves so they can stay joyful all the time. I rely on coffee, by the way. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, you know they, so that they're separate so could, you have the big pictures. Out. I, mean, I love walking with you, and I want you guys to know that no matter what you're walking through, God can make a door of hope for you. He can make a door of hope for you. You have to decide are you going to walk through it or not. But in the midst of the valley of Accor, the valley of trouble, our God Loves you and will make an open door for you. So looking again at Hosea and Gomer, um, there's some wisdom here that is given to any of you that maybe have experienced unfaithfulness. And, and, and guys, I want you to know that um, that is very common in our culture. It's very, very common in our culture. And, not, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty. I can't see any faces today. But I'm not picking on anyone. It's very common in our culture. I have a message um, for you guys if you've gone through this. Forgive and love as you've been forgiven and loved. Because here's the reality. Here's the reality. And I said it, but I'll say it again. Nobody in this room is any better than anybody else. Let's say a big amen to that. Nobody in this room is better than anybody else because every person in this room, we all have committed spiritual adultery against a God who has never forsaken us, left us, or stopped loving us. That is so much worse than anything I could ever do to my wife, Jessica. So we're, we're all on equal footing. But for those of us that have had the special pain of having that brokenness in our marriage, this is what we're called to do. Hosea 3.1. The Lord said to Hosea, Go, and I want you to show your love to your wife again. Though she's loved by another as an adulteress, love her in what way? What does it say, Ignite Church? It's the Lord loves you. Whoa! That's a big deal, y'all. That's a big deal, and it, and it goes beyond marriage. That goes beyond anything. For those of you who are single, you say, you know, what does this message have for me? If you're single, I want you to pursue loving God, because until you understand what it means to love God, you'll never be able to love anybody else right. Someone say amen to that. Because if you can't love God right and he's perfect, how in the world are you going to love your imperfect spouse? You're just not going to be able to do it well. For those of you guys that are dating and you are in love... You think anyway, you, and you might be. Some of you think you are. Has more to do with hormones than than heart. You know, I'm just saying. You know, <laughs> but for those of you that, that are in love, love your girlfriend or boyfriend the way that God loves you with purity and integrity and beauty and commitment. Love your boyfriend or girlfriend in a way that if God was in the room with you, because by the way, He is in the room with you all the time. Someone say Amen. He would be pleased with the way you're loving your boyfriend or your girlfriend. If you have to do something you think you're going to have to hide from God, you should not be doing it. 
and husbands and wives. My goodness. Being married is hard. <laughs> it's very hard. Yeah, yeah, thank you. He's receiving an elbow to the face right now. You just can't see it because it's dark. <laughs> but you're right. It is. It's very, very hard. Love your spouse and forgive your spouse and be there for your spouse the way that God has done all those things for you. Here is the secret to a happy marriage right here in Hosea 10, 12. And it's so simple, but it's so hard. He says, look, I want you, this is what God's speaking. He says, sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up your unplowed ground for it's time to do what? Seek the Lord. Ooh, that's good. Until he comes and showers righteousness on you. My brothers and my sisters, you can search high and low for the secret to a happy marriage. You can go to conferences. You can look at books. You can check out Fifty Shades of Grey. Don't check out Fifty Shades of Grey, but you could. You can go all these places looking for what is the secret, what is the trick. It is found in Jesus. Jesus is the secret. He is the power. He is the center. And what he calls us to do, he says, look, if you're in a relationship with a spouse and, 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 it's, and it's challenging and it's difficult, you need to start plowing up some unplowed ground. In other words, what God is saying very simply, this is Jesus, um, Jason dumbing it down just a little bit for, for me and for, for us. If you want what you've never had, do what you've never done. That's good enough to write down. If you want what you never had, do what you've never done. And it sounds ridiculous. And I meet with couples and I say, do this. And it sounds if you've never prayed together as a couple, do you think God might transform your marriage through the power of prayer? If you've never studied scripture together as a couple, do you think that the God of heaven and earth could transform your relationship through his word? If you want what you never had, do something you never um, don't Don't do the same thing and expect a different result. Plow some unplowed hard ground and see what fruit will come of that. That's why I personally asked Josh today, guys, and I mean it with all my heart, what I'm about to say. We want to come alongside you in this, but I cannot sit at every one of your homes every night. <laughs> you can't have a personal pastor, Jason. That would be weird. <laughs> um, I'm travel size, but not that, that much so. Anyway, um, uh, just be awkward. <laughs> but um, I asked him to mention the Right Now Media, because I'm just being real about me. Um, I, I, I'm a reader, and I love the Bible, but for me and my wife, one of the things that we've always loved to do together since day one, we've loved watching movies together and watching shows together. You go to Right Now Media, there is at least 70 different studies on marriage for those of you that are married. So why not go out tonight, sit down with a bowl of popcorn, watch something that's going to feed your soul and feed your marriage, and see if God could transform your marriage through the power of his word. Because you're going to probably watch something anyway. So I'm, I'm begging you guys, for those of you that are single, and it's hard being pure, and it's hard being a man of integrity or a woman of integrity. I'm telling you, again, not that the videos are going to solve your problem. All the videos are going to do is make you realize how bad a preacher I am, because there's some awesome preaching on these things, man. They're really good. You know, I don't want to go to here just anymore. That's okay. <laughs> I still love you anyway. But the videos won't do it. But Jesus, he can transform the way you look at being single. He can transform the way you look at purity. And so um, I, I want to invite you um, to, to be practical. I, I had a guy this week, and the reason why I say that, and I'm, I'm almost done, y'all, I promise. But I had a guy this week that come to me and, and said, Jason, what you say, I agree with it 100%. I just don't know what to do. I just don't know. And especially for men who are married, I'm expecting you guys to be spiritual leaders. And it's like the thought of praying with my wife, I'd rather die. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd rather stab myself with a knife almost than, than do that. And I, I get it. It's, it's, it's scary and, and it's hard. And so I want to make it real simple. Um, there's a guy in my small group. His, his name is Dale, and I think he's here uh, somewhere. He's awesome at, like, wiring sound. and, and all that. It's, Me telling you guys to be a good spouse, it's kind of like Dale saying, just hook up your surround system, Jason. You know, it's like, if you don't dumb it down for me, Dale, it ain't never going to have, you know. I'd have holes in every wall of my house and still no sound. It, so I'm just saying, it's true. Um, so use that as a resource, please. And start somewhere walking with the Lord together. And I, prom I can promise you this. If you as a couple will seek out God, and if you as a single person, and if you as a dating couple, if you guys will seek out the Father together, he will transform your relationships with him and each other in ways you can't imagine. That's just truth. I can say that, and it is truth. So please, let's go out today and seek him. He is the secret to love illuminated. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, I thank you for a story like Hosea and Gomer messed up people, broken people, um, who were striving to walk with each other and walk with you. And of course, in this story, Father Hosea, he's such a representative of Jesus. His wife 
was unfaithful to him, and instead of casting her aside, he goes into the prostitution den, and he pays the pimp to buy her back so that she would be with him. In the midst of my sin, and in the midst of my brother's and sister's sin,